Since the early 2000s, the amount of female protagonists in film has gone down from 16% in 2002 to 15% in 2013 and 12% in 2015. Too often, these women are portrayed as inadequate, materialistic, emotionally unstable, and just plain awful. Women are most often seen in drama and romance films, but are scarcely seen in action or comedy. The few times women are in leading action roles, they tend to reject any feminine qualities, which may suggest that as a woman, you can only be strong if you act more like a man. Some of these include Sandra Bullock's role in Miss Congeniality. The IMBD description of the film states, Undercover FBI agent Gracie Hart shows no signs of having any femininity in her demeanor or appearance. Despite Gracie's managed demeanor, her boss, with no other undercover female agents remotely fitting the demographic, assigns her to go undercover as a pageant contestant to see if she can flush out the citizen. The Hunger Games films have been considered one of the most iconic feminist-friendly trilogies of our generation. However, I would beg to differ. In the first film in the trilogy, The Hunger Games, we are introduced to our female protagonist, Katniss Everdeen. We open to see Katniss hunting in the woods with her signature weapon, a bow and arrow, trying to provide for her mother and sister after the passing of her father. Right off the bat, she has rejected the traditional domestic roles of the other women in her district and taken on more of a fatherly role. She goes on to exhibit an even further paternal instinct when Katniss's sister, Primrose, is chosen to participate in the Hunger Games, a televised fight to the death implemented after the destruction of District 13. Katniss jumps to her feet and becomes the first person to ever volunteer themselves to the games. This was considered a paternal sacrifice, similar to joining the military, as she was sacrificing herself into battle for the sake of her family. While preparing for the games, Katniss is forced to wear dresses and other showy outfits for interviews. She is assigned a stylist who sympathizes with her disgust for dressing up. These themes seem to suggest that if you despise makeup and ball gowns in order to be a strong woman. After the start of the games, Katniss develops an alliance with one of her other competitors named Rue. Sadly, Rue is killed when a competitor throws his spear just as Katniss shoots him with her bow and arrow. Katniss sinks to her knees as she realizes she is alone in the games once again. According to a feminist critique of the film, Katniss's greatest weakness is how much she cares for others. This is clear as her ability to care for others is what got her into the games in the first place. Her weakest points were when she acted like a mother. She's considered weak if she's grieving or caring for someone other than herself. Katniss's teammate is a baker from her district named Peta Malark. Peta shows a real romantic interest in Katniss at the very beginning of the trilogy. Peta is considered weaker than Katniss, and I don't think it's a coincidence that he portrays many traditionally fem feminine qualities. After Rue's death, Katniss and Peta team up. After Peta is injured, they spend the night in a cave. Katniss gets injured while trying to get medication for Peta, and when she comes back, he lays virtually immobile while she is walking around with a similar energy injury to his. They cuddle up together and share a kiss, which is the first development in their relationship. While Peta truly has feelings for Katniss, she puts it on a show for the Capitol. The Capitol is the antagonist in the film. It is filled with rich, materialistic, showy people who watch The Hunger Games like it's a reality TV show. Again, I do not think it's a coincidence that the women and even men wear makeup and flamboyant clothing and are considered the villains in the film. I would argue that the antagonist in the film is truly femininity itself. The leader of the Capitol is a man named President Snow. He tries to kill Katniss multiple times as she becomes the face of the rebellion, labeled as the Mockingjay. He's a lover of white roses, which Katniss hates, of course. In an article entitled, Why the Hunger Games World is No Country for Glamorous Women, they speculate she despises roses due to their feminine nature. As Katniss and Peta's relationship is, now, is a huge part of the film, while Peta believes the love between them is real, the majority of the film Katniss is putting on a show for the Capitol. The citizens of the Capitol will sponsor them and send them more supplies if they are intrigued by their romantic relationship or storyline. At the end of the first movie, only Katniss and Peta remain. The game can only have one winner, so they come up with a plan to eat poisonous berries and die together. President Snow declares them both winners directly before they eat them, which Katniss was planning for the whole time, while Peta was really planning to go through with the Romeo and Juliet scenario. In the second film, Catching Fire, a rebellion begins among the districts against the Capitol. Peta is now aware of their relationship 
in the fact that it is staged and they begin planning their pretend wedding. The Capitol, attempting to get rid of Katniss, holds another set of games with previous winners of the games as the stars. Sort of a Hunger Games All-Stars. PETA joins a new alliance while in the games until later on when they join up with other competitors and devise a plan to shoot a metal arrow into the lightning storm. This destroys the re- arena as a result and the rebellion re- rescues Katniss but fails to find PETA. When Katniss awakes later on, she is greeted by Gail, her love interest from back in District 12 before she was in the games with PETA. Many feminist critics applaud her ability to use Gail's feelings for her to her own advantage like when she has him go to retrieve PETA, which he does. When they return, they discover PETA has been brainwashed to want to kill Katniss, and he tries to on several occasions. This pinpoints femininity as dangerous. PETA is a damsel in distress of sorts, and in the process of trying to save him, Katniss almost gets killed herself. In an article by Tor, a movie critic website, they claim Katniss is a heroine due to the fact that she is the anti-Bella Swan. They say this is evident because Katniss does something more worthwhile than simply choosing between two men. However, I spent many of my teen years watching the Twilight Saga and would consider myself an expert on these films. I guess that Tor does not consider Bella, the female protagonist in the Twilight Saga, giving birth to a child who is literally destroying her from the inside out and fighting off hordes of vampires and other mythical creatures to be strong or heroic seems quite hypocritical when you consider the fact that Katniss Everdeen spends a great portion, probably half of the movie, in an internal battle over whether she wants to be with Peter or Gale, similar to Bella Swan, who chooses between Edward Cullen and Jacob Black. Truly, the only difference between Bella and Katniss is that Bella has a larger sense of femininity. She is oftentimes emotional and tries to please her boyfriend. However, she never attempts to please him in any way that would threaten her own identity. Because of this small difference, Bella is considered a weak, submissive character, while Katniss is a hero. Throughout the trilogy, feminists stuck by the movie's side, claiming it as the most feminist-friendly movie series of the decade. However, many feminist extremists dropped the movie and denounced it as being an anti-feminist and adopting gender stereotypes. They say this because at the end of Mockingjay Part 2, which is the epilogue when referring to the books, Katniss is seen playing with her and Peeta's children in a film field. She sits with her infant daughter as Peeta plays with her son in the open field that once home District 12. Feminist extremists claim that this scene destroyed the feminist theme of the film because Katniss settled for marital bliss and having children. However, in the book's epilogue and the movie's ending, Katniss appears to be happy and content with the new life that she has made with Peeta and their children. Feminist extremists often criticize women who stay home with their children instead of getting a job because they point out the fact that women worked hard to escape from these domestic roles. However, we are truly being anti-feminist if we denounce stay-at-home mothers. Women worked hard not so that other women would be forced to work, but so that they could make the choice between a professional and domestic lifestyle. Katniss merely chose and adopted the domestic lifestyle and should not be stripped of her heroine title for it. I'm not here to claim that Katniss is not a heroine or a feminist icon. She certainly is considering that she rather single-handedly overthrew President Snow and the Capitol and became the poster child and leader of the rebellion. The issue is not that Katniss simply rejects feminine stereotypes. The issue is that many people consider her lack of femininity to be the sole reason she is a heroine. If Katniss was interested in domestic life and wore pink and frilly clothing and loved those dreaded white roses, she wouldn't be considered strong. She would have required more help from her male counterparts like Peeta or Gail. She would have been written in as the sidekick rather than the hero. We are telling women that the only way they can be strong is if they act more like a man. That's the true issue with Hollywood sexism.